What's going on, everybody? It's live stream 35, and the topic of the hour is stopping mass shootings and gun control. Obviously, this is a very hot topic right now. So uh, we figured we'd take our turn and kick this around. I've assembled a, uh, a large panel. I've got some familiar faces and some we haven't seen in a while. So let's go around and introduce everybody. So first and foremost, we got Chad. Chad's a good buddy of mine. We served together in Bravo Company, 1st Battalion, 23rd Marines, 2010-2011 time frame in Afghanistan, Helmand Province. And uh, Chad's a Marine veteran that also served in OIF-1, which is the initial invasion of Iraq. And he went back in OIF-2 and fought in the Battle of Fallujah. He brings an excellent military perspective to the chat, and he's trying to get his uh, military doctorate's degree. So, Chad, thanks for jumping on tonight, brother. All right, we next we got Les. Les with Pegasus Test. That is his YouTube channel. Be sure to check it out. Les is an expert at logistics. He has his own logistics company. He also has his own tactical training company called Polaris Tactics and Simulations Division. And uh, he was a Marine, served in the early 90s, and is a veteran of the Gulf War. Always brings a great point to the conversation. So, Les, thanks for jumping on tonight. Glad to be here, Brett. All right, next we got my good buddy, Bruce. Bruce of Camp Armament. That is his YouTube channel. That is his Instagram handle. Be sure to check him out. Bruce is an armorer. He does some outstanding Cerakote work. Be sure to check out his Instagram. You can see a lot of his completed projects, and they're just amazing. Bruce was also a uh, former aircraft mechanic, and he has some experience going to civilian uh, tactical training schools. And Bruce brings that civilian perspective to the chat because uh, all of us kind of approach it from the military aspect, so it's nice to have that civilian perspective. So, Bruce, thanks for jumping on tonight, brother. All right, next, we got the villain. We got Michael. Welcome back, brother. So Michael is a veteran United States Marine Corps, served honorably. I believe you're an air wing, right? Correct. And uh, he brings a usually different perspective, uh, and that's why we like to bring him on so that we can hook and jab with him from time to time. Um, so, Michael, welcome on, man. Hoorah. Thank you for having me. All right, brother. All right. Last but not least, we got Doc Christopher Larson. He's the original founder of One Shepherd, going 40 years strong. Doc is a U.S. Army veteran. He's an NCO. He served in Korea in the 80s, hooked and jabbed with the North Koreans from time to time. He's an accomplished author. He's written many books on small unit tactics. He's a wealth of knowledge and always a pleasure having him on. All right, guys, that is our panel. And I just want to mention that I might have one more gentleman jumping on, and that's Major Fred Galvin. So if he happens to join us tonight, that would be awesome. But uh, we're going to go ahead and push because we are at that 1,500 timeline. So opening the floor, I'm going to go ahead and go around the horn, kicking it off with our usual starting pitcher, Les. All right. Well, mass shootings and gun control laws. Um I'm kind of a, a miffed at our politicians about this, to say the least, because murder is already illegal, and that doesn't seem to be solving the problem. So I'm kind of at a loss to what a new law is going to do. Also, with these recent spat of shootings, a lot of data is still coming out, so it's somewhat premature to draw definitive conclusions. But it's looking like a lot of warning signs were there and a lot of balls got dropped. And if that turns out ultimately to be the case, then I see no reason that the general public needs to be bothered and uh, burdened with new laws for problems that these laws will not solve. All right. Um, let me first say, you know, every time this happens, it doesn't get any easier. Um, as a father of two young children, I, I have to hold back tears every time this happens. Um, I can't for the life of me understand what would possess someone to target innocent children. Uh, to be able to look a young child in the eye and pull the trigger, that's a whole different level of crazy. Uh, I don't think I'm alone here. So uh, that being said, time is the healer of all wounds. And I do wish the residents of Uvalde a speedy recovery. Um, as for the topic on hand, uh, most of my arguments are on the fact that we do not have a gun problem in this country. We have a morality problem in this country. We have a mental health problem in this country. Um, so what can we do about it? Uh, we're going to get to that shortly. Well, I have to I have to second uh, Chad's sentiments uh, for all the tragedies that have bef be befelt us, whether it's uh, children in schools or uh, black kids in, in inner cities or 
what, what, wherever, wherever crime rears its, its evil head, I do think that Chad really, really, really hit the, net, the nail on the head there when he talked about a fall in morality within families. We can get into that. I do think that that's one of the common factors that all of these shootings, or at least most of them, seem to have in common with one another is a, a lack of ethics and a lack of morality. That being said, there's always been evil in our world. Um, there have always been evil people, but it seems like uh, we're seeing more of them uh, that might could have been deterred through good family upbringing, uh, religion and community values that uh, we don't seem to have today, which we had, say, uh, 40, 50 years ago. So um, hopefully we can get more into that. Um, and I do want to talk about uh, the, the two types of solutions that are being posed out there. One of those being a joke, which is political uh, solutions, and the other being real solutions where we set our biases aside. We look at what we can do to uh, curb these type, this types of violence using um, laws or uh, community standards and morales and not infringing on other people's rights. Yeah, um, certainly uh, echo the same sentiments as Bruce and Chad and I'm sure everyone else here on that, you know, this is a tragic, um, situation that's happened one too many times in this country. Um, I just look forward to having a, an open discussion on, you know, reaching solutions or consensus on things that we can do to mitigate and prevent this from happening. And, uh, you know, we'll have our differences of opinion and whatnot on certain things, but perhaps uh, towards the end, we can at least come to agreement on, on a few things and, and go from there. So look forward to the discussion. All right, so my concern about this panel is that, and I don't see a way around this, I noticed that there's not really opposition. I think um, there is some expectation that Michael and myself will present some kind of opposition. I suspect we will not fairly represent the other side of this discussion, which there's that can be separated into the lunatic, lunatic emotional side of it, which emotion is part of human. So I'm not saying it's illegitimate, but I'm saying it's an extreme emotional visceral reaction. And from that it, legitimacy, maybe in closure and healing, but not so much in solutions. Then there's the other side of the other side. And that is that there are people who are recommending things that they sincerely believe might solve this problem. So what I want to do is challenge my panel, um, my fellow panelists, and say that as we present an argument or as we present a solution, um, my ch challenge to you over the next couple of hours is to present uh, arguments that you believe sincerely have been made um, and not to create straw man arguments, easy straw man arguments, and then dismiss them as all as lunatic but to, to honestly try to represent the other side of the discussion, because otherwise we're gonna have two hours of us all going, yeah, I agree with you, man. Um, so let's try and represent the salient parts of people who may not agree with our perspectives and solutions. Thanks for saying that, Doc. Uh, so I did you know, try at least to, to bring somebody in that I thought might have a, a slightly different uh, perspective. So we'll see how much that differs, if at all. Uh, and that Doc makes a great point. Uh, we should consider what the other side is bringing to the table, um, both their far extreme sides and then their more moderate sides, because uh, let's, you know, there are there are people on the other side that are more reasonable. If, if there wasn't, well, then we would have draconian anti-gun laws passed right now. Uh, so in any event, uh, let me just say 14 killed, 31 wounded by a single gunman. I'm not talking about a recent mass shooting. I'm talking about one that happened in 1966 from Charles Whitman from the, the, uh, clock tower. Okay. Mass shootings have been around for ever guys. They, they've always happened. Okay. Still statistically, you're more likely to get hit by lightning than you are to be a victim in, in a mass shooting. All right. So as tragic as these events are, and they are tragic, they are not something that's happening all the time. 
Okay. Now, just because the the news likes to sensationalize one of these events when they do happen, doesn't mean that there's this mass pandemic of these things happening. So I see absolutely no reason to impede on the rights of law-abiding American citizens, particularly when it comes to guns, because of small isolated instances, nor should it ever. Even if these things were happening every day, I wouldn't support any infringement on the Second Amendment because the Second Amendment is for personal protection and to keep the federal government in check. And I think we shouldn't deviate from that. Uh, we should not go down this path saying that the Second Amendment is only for hunting. It's not only for hunting. Never has been, never will be. So um, I think there are some common sense solutions that we can look at. What's actually going to stop these problems? In my opinion, what do you do when you have an enemy force penetrating your defensive lines? Okay. You defend those positions. You beef those positions up, right? You dig more fighting positions. You make your, sure your, your machine guns are interlocking sectors of fire, right? You're covering likely avenues of enemy approach. This is a military mindset that I'm taking right here. But why don't we look at this from that perspective of, okay, what are our critical vulnerabilities here? You know, what's happening? How are these dipshits allowed or able to gain access into this building? Why why aren't people focusing on that stuff? Okay. Why do I have um, immediately people going to, well, well, how come these people can buy these weapons, these weapons of war, these weapons of war, which they're not weapons of war. There's not a single AR-15, semi-automatic AR-15 in the armory of any U.S. military base in this country. So... Uh, frankly, I'm, I'm sick and tired of the, the attack on the Second Amendment argument uh, that's that's constantly being levied, and uh, it, it's really pissing me off. So uh, we needed to have this discussion. I tried to do an interview with war fighters uh, with my good buddy, uh, Sergeant Van Buskirk, the other day, and like I'm in a corner of my eye, I'm looking at the comments, and nobody gave a shit about this war fighter I was interviewing. Everybody wants to talk about this. So I tried to tell those people, hey. We will have a time for this. Well, the time is now, so we're doing it. So with that being said, I'm going to open it up to the floor so we can kick this around. All right. Well, you bring up some great points there, Brent. And um, as I said in my opening monologue, you know, murder is already illegal. It doesn't matter how you kill somebody. If you kill somebody and it's not self-defense to keep yourself or your family alive, you're guilty of murder. Whether you kill them with a rifle, a baseball bat, a rock, you poison them, you push them off a building, it's still murder. And how you do it doesn't really matter. And why somebody thinks a new law is going to solve this problem, because our laws against people under 18 having access to cigarettes says that's illegal, yet I see kids smoking all the time. Uh, we, say, we say that you can't drink under 21, yet... Anybody seen young Marines, and young college students have any problem getting access to alcohol? The laws only work uh, with people who are going to obey them. These uh, gentlemen who commit these mass uh, shootings, they are disturbed individuals. They are not law abiding people. So writing a law that says you can't have X is not going to prevent them from doing what they're going to do. Because I have a feeling if this gentleman couldn't get access to an AR-15 to go commit his crime, he'd have burnt the building down. Or maybe he would have run a car into it. Or he would have built a bomb. It wouldn't have mattered. You, the problem is with the person, not with inanimate objects. And as long as we keep focusing on his an, inanimate objects, we're going to continue to have the problem. Yeah, so I'll jump in our, and say that no, nothing that less said here does it negates the tragedy of what we're seeing violence exists and uh you know with, with humanity and we're never going to get that out of humanity i heard uh someone earlier this morning saying well you know when america perfects itself in a thousand years america won't perfect itself even if it exists in a thousand years it won't perfect itself there's no such thing and and tying your hands and i'm hearing this discussion a lot on all sides, by the way, not picking on one, that are saying, well, there's no perfect solution, so let's do nothing. Or no, there's no perfect solution, so therefore I'm going to give you, you know, I'm going to punish somebody that does that isn't guilty. It doesn't matter. He, let me let me talk about this. Um, so we're talking about 
1966 shooting there in, uh, was that Austin, Texas, Brent, wasn't it? All right, well, here's an earlier one. To my knowledge, the first mass murder, and this is terrible, it's terrible that we have these kind of historical data, but the first mass killing at a school was in 1927 at the Bath Schoolhouse in Michigan. 1927, 38 children killed, six adults killed, 44 people killed. I don't know how many wounded. What was the weapons of choice? Two bombs, one in the schoolhouse, one in a truck that the man, that the bomber drew, uh, drove. So, and, and oh, by the way, it's actually three bombs. One didn't go off. That's why the numbers were so low. This man was one of the, um, I believe he was one of the superintendents on the school board. And he attacked his own children and, and killed them. Um, as a matter of fact, the Sandy Hook shooting. So you want to say, well, okay, so, you know, I don't know, explosions, right? Fire. I mean, there's, uh, there's been mass murders. Um, oh, what was the fire there in New York City and another one in, in New Orleans? Uh, some of the highest mass murder you've ever seen, all by fire, by gasoline, right? Um, anyway, uh, you know, even you going to Sandy Hook, just another horrific tragedy, heartbreaking, and yet you go, well, we're going to stop these people from getting guns. No, I know. I, I think this is interesting that all sides of it agree that you can't get rid of guns. And Sandy Hook, someone correct me if I'm wrong, I may be thinking of a different mass shooting, sadly enough, but I'm pretty sure Sandy Hook was the one where the gentleman was too crazy to get a firearm. So he murdered his mother and took her AR-15, then went to the school with a stolen AR-15 from his murdered mother and then shot up the school. Um, there are more firearms than there are humans in America. You're never getting rid of firearms. So how about we come up with solutions that recognize that reality? I have an aunt. I have an aunt um, who is strictly, adamantly, rabidly anti-gun. And even she admits, well, in a perfect world, if I had magic, I would not only get rid of every single firearm known to humanity, every single weapon known to humanity, I would get rid of the knowledge of how to recreate those. So I have a conversation with her and I'm like, okay, is that real? And she's like, no, of course, there's no magic that exists. Even if I could get rid of all the weapons, people will build new ones. So I'm like, all right, then we have to come up. We have to recognize that reality. We don't have the magic to get rid of weapons. What's the solution? Well, I think part of uh, understanding what the solution is, is kind of identifying the problem and where it all started. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, we don't have a gun problem in this country. Like, like you said, Doc, there are more guns than people, as our new press secretary pointed out. Uh, some estimates put the number of guns in the USA around 600 million. That's twice the population. Um, if guns were the sole problem, every person in this country would be dead. So, no, we don't have a gun problem. We have a morality problem. We have a mental health problem in this country. You know, during the 70s and 80s, we started closing the vast majority of our mental health facilities. And since the collapse of the Soviet Union, we've seen a society devolve into a narcissist filled haven ripe with mental illness caused by the destruction of the family for various reasons, be it drugs, abuse or incentivized single parenthood mm -hmm. and destruction of our tribal integrity as a nation. We went from a moral and rational society to a feelings based society. And this presents a problem because feelings are strictly subjective and not objectively moral. John Adams, in an address to the Massachusetts militia in 1789, correctly stated our Constitution is, was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. 1790, George Washington, a free people ought not only to be armed, but disciplined. So, Doc, you wanted some, uh, some disagreement here. So, in a sense, I, I do kind of understand where the big-hearted liberals are coming from. Because if we lose our morality, we don't deserve our rights period. Hmm. So the major problem with this is how do we measure morality in an individual? And I'm not sure that can even be done. That may be one of the things we discuss. But moving on a little bit, I, I do know one thing. I do know when this downward spiral in our society started. It had foundations in the 1960s. However, it really started with the war on religion, specifically under the Clinton administration. Now, let me preface this by saying I don't have a dog in this fight. I'm not religious. As I've stated in a previous video, I'm an atheist. I've always been an atheist. 
There was even a time when I was a hardcore left-wing militant atheist bent on the destruction of religion in this country. But then I grew up. Now I want to live in a religious America, like Bruce was talking about in his introduction, and I often find myself defending the moral foundations of our country, that being Judeo-Christian values. Something bad has happened with this war on religion, and it hasn't served us well. Hey, real quick, guys, I got a, another guest I'm going to bring in. He can only be here for a short period of time. Um, I think he might be having some camera issues, uh, but nonetheless, hopefully he's got some audio. Hey, Fred, can you hear us? Uh oh, <laughs> all right, well, well, we'll work on that. Somebody else can pick up. Oh, someone want to, I mean, Chad threw down the gauntlet. Someone want to pick up that? I mean, the fact is, you know, my father, who's devoutly Catholic, was, he was passed away, um, devoutly Christian. Um, and yeah, I should say devoutly Christian and converted to, from Protestant Christianity to Catholic. Uh, Christianity and you know anyway my, my point here is that he talked about removing the Ten Commandments from government buildings including education uh, institutions but others as well like judicial institutions and stuff and he said even as a devout Christian he didn't object to this inherently he was like I get it they're saying hey Judeo-Christian I would say Judeo-Christian Islamic traditions because they all go back to those Ten Commandments um, but nonetheless that kind of cuts out Buddhist, Hindu, um, you know, uh, not making a joke like Druid or, you know, some of your shaman religions. And he said, so there, you know, it wasn't very inclusive. He had no problem with it being removed. He only had a problem with it not being replaced. Let me say that again, because it goes to what Chad was saying. He didn't have a problem with the Ten Commandments or some moral code being removed, only that we did not replace with another moral code. And of course, the problem there, and you, you know, smart cookies get it right away. Oh, okay. Go ahead and replace it with another moral code because they all come from one spiritual tradition or another. So good luck having it sans spirituality. Um, so I mean, that's a whole nother discussion, but the point is we see that we see this effort to strip society of religious and moral codes. How's that working for us? And I'll, I'll, I'll chime in on, on what Chad said also and clarify a little bit. I mean, I'm, I'm Christian and Pentecostal. I'm by no means um, a saint or someone that uh, anyone should try to emulate. I pretty much so have made all the mistakes that, that could be made within the religion. And that's why I feel like I, I can speak from a bit of experience on it. But that being said, um, it doesn't matter. I, you know, it doesn't matter what religion you are necessarily or whether you're atheist or agnostic. I've got a, I've got a good friend that's agnostic and I have a great time having lots of conversations with him because he can typically play the devil's advocate and give different views on any situation or circumstance that we're talking about. But he's got a great family. They've got great uh, moral values uh, that aren't tied to religion. You know, just because um you're not Christian doesn't mean you can, but you don't have to, that you can't believe to treat other people fairly, to treat other people with respect, to try to approach situations with nonviolence. And I think, I think a really big, a really, really big part of it um, is, is sort of shame and embarrassment that's been taken away from families and people can get on social media now, or they can, they can behave in ways that 40, 50 years ago, they would have been shamed by their family they would have been shamed by the community to have acted that way. There was there was this this inherent belief in people that I don't want to do anything to bring embarrassment to myself, my family, or my community. That is gone. We don't have that anymore. Not with these. That's one thing that a lot of these shooters have in common. They don't care. They're not tied in closely with their family, or they come from broken families. They're not tied in closely with the church or any type of religious group, and they're not tied in closely with their community. They're sort of like uh, outcasts or outsiders, and because of that, eventually they act out, and they act out a thousand times over. We don't hear about, but sometimes they act out in a way that causes the the death of other innocent people. And I, I mean, I think that s some of you really said it, said it best at first. How do you go in and look a child in the eye, any child, and hurt that child? I can't, 
I can't fathom it. Being a father myself and having children around me all the time, I just, I look at those kids and I'm like, how could anybody, I can't relate. I don't understand. I mean, it's a serious question. Like I would like to ask them like, seriously, what, what's inside of you that makes you think that that's okay? And how anybody could classify that as not being a mental health issue, I don't know. Because you have to be sick in order to that. That's not something normal people have do. It's not something normal people have ever done. Go back and far in history as you want. Typically in all communities, in all religions, even where there is no religion, you look after kids, you look after your family, and you take care of them. All right, I said what I need to say. Hello, Fred. Welcome. We've got you on camera. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate being on the show. And uh, I just want to say things for a couple minutes is uh, give an experience from when I was in the Marines and then when I was out of the Marines. Uh, one of our deployments to Afghanistan, we were over there, not to shame the Army. This was just an individual commander's um, decision. But he decided to put a, instead of a, a soldier in the turret manning the machine gun on his Humvee, he decided, oh, I'm going to put a tire on there because we come in peace. Um, well, I will explain that uh, he made some videos. And this this gentleman right now is being nominated in the Center Armed Service Committee <clears throat> here in this month of June uh, to take over to be uh, the four-star commanding general, Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, uh, uh, General Chris Cavoli. But they had the highest number of casualties in that Army Brigade of any unit that was ever deployed to Afghanistan. Um, we were there at the same time, our Marine Special Operations Task Force. We didn't put a tire, as he did, on the top of their turret. Uh, you know, they wanted to show signs of peace. Uh, and I'm getting to get to my point here in a second, but we were attacked by a car bomb in a complex ambush. Uh, folks shooting at us from both sides of the road and sniper fire. We fired back and we killed those who were shooting at us. Now I want to transition uh, to a second example when I retired and moved back to the Mid-America area. And I put these uh, drive-up automatic teller machines. This is my small business I owned. I installed them all throughout the inner city uh, there in Mid-America, different uh, areas. But it was a high crime area um, because of the way, you know, my because of my race, uh, I was a target. And I had to dress to blend in. Uh, to restock these automatic teller machines, I was armed. Uh, there was a few times I, I had to, uh, you know, let people know that, you know, hey, if you're if you're here to threaten me, it's it's not going to go well. Your life will be required of you, and so people think that there's no reason to have a weapon. Um, and what exactly happens uh, both in combat and overseas? Well. Those that didn't have weapons or decided not to put a person in a armed person in the, their vehicle, they had the highest casualty rate. Same thing, uh, y if you enter the lion's den like I was uh, working at in places in uh, mid-America and some of these inner cities, you go in there unarmed and look like a you know, little lamb, you're going to be slaughtered. Uh, and it's the same thing. Look where all these attacks are, places where there are no arms at schools. Uh, I've been listening to your conversation and, you know, they're, they're not attacking Fort Knox. They're not attacking police stations. Um, they're attacking the soft targets. So, you know, it's, doesn't take someone, you know, planning interplanetary travel to figure out that when there is no weapons, it's just like drugs. You can have all the laws you want against drugs, uh, like we have, but people are still going to use it. And, um, uh, you can try to take all the weapons away or say it's illegal. All you're going to do is keep it away from law abiding citizens. And you're going to have the same situation that you have in the inner cities of America. You're going to have that going on all over the place. You're going to have terrorism because look what's happened in these societies throughout world history. Uh, when they disarm the society, uh, the government takes over and there is no security. It's a, it's not in our benefit to do that. So these are tragic uh, it's a complex problem, and it's not going to be solved uh, swiftly by uh, people sitting there thinking that we needed to disarm. So those are just my two cents. 
Hey, if I can just introduce you real quick, Fred, I don't, uh, yeah. I don't think uh, we got the pr privilege yet. So uh, this is Major Fred Galvin, United States Marine Corps retired. He served 26 years, and uh, he was part of the Marine Special Operations Company Foxtrot. His, uh, his unit got involved in a significant firefight in Afghanistan, and his guys were essentially hung out to dry. They were the, uh, uh, the target of a special court of inquiry, and uh, he's got a new book coming out called A Few Bad Men. And this book comes out, is it on the 7th of this month, Fred? Yes, that's correct. The 7th on Tuesday. And it's available. The order right now on Amazon, you're not charged for it until it ships. So you'll get it uh, early next week. It's a so, was, true was, nonfiction story about what should never happen to uh, American warriors uh, who go fight for our country. And uh, it'll be shocking, that's for sure. And just to remind you guys, if you guys haven't seen it, I did an interview with Fred uh, a few months back and a uh, very awesome interview. So definitely check that out and uh, check out the book. But Fred, thanks for joining our uh, conversation tonight, bud. I really appreciate it, Brent and gentlemen. Uh, thank you and uh, enjoyed being part of the show. But I'll let you uh, get back to the, the heart of the matter. All right. <laughs> All right, brother. Semper Fi. Semper Fi. Bye. Well, I mean, I, uh, I think Fred raises – a valuable question. And I want to get back to Bruce's question. How, how could they hurt a child? But to address Fred's point, um, quote, people think there's no reason to have a weapon. Um, and I, I, I want to dispel that myth that I mentioned earlier, my aunt, and I'm not going to drag her name through the mud. Um, but nonetheless, my aunt is from her own admission, rabidly anti-gun. And so when we took that farther and I said, okay, look, aunt, uh, whose gun do you want to get rid of? Well, that's when, you know, through various discussions, she admitted, well, I want to get rid of every gun, uh, every firearm, every weapon, weapon on the face of the planet and take away humanity's knowledge how to make it. Is that practical was my next question. Of course, she said, no, no such dark magic exists. So I said, all right, so let's get down to, um, let's get down to the brass tacks. Whose guns do you want to take away? And now I'm going to paraphrase because she would never have said it this way, but this is the, this is the unethical um, position that I think my aunt champions. And she's got a very dear, very dear heart. She's an intelligent, educated woman. Um, and long career as a journalist and all sorts of other wonderful things. I, I, I mean, I like her, but she was saying, look, then the practical answer is I want to take away every weapon system that doesn't benefit me personally. And that's a perception. She would have recognized that. That's a perception. I perceive that the police officers and security professionals benefit me. I perceive that military personnel and federal law enforcement benefit me. But because I perceive that they benefit me, I don't want their weapons taken away. Anybody who I do not perceive as benefiting directly myself in minor or major ways, I want to take their weapons away. Well, of course, perception is one of the critical things. Why keep repeating it? Um, First off, all of those people, all of the above, can wind up going against her, her wishes, her desires, even her security, like, and her life. They can go against her and line her up against the wall or whatever in the worst situations because uh, democide, that is the government killing its own people, is the number one killer uh, for the past, I don't know, 500, 1,000 years. The number one killer of humanity and violence, anyway, has been democide. And so that's a very ill-conceived perception of hers. Um, but moreover, uh, so her greatest threat is her own government. And she's saying, yeah, but I perceive that they are not my greatest threat. So let's keep them armed and disarm everybody else. But moreover, it's an immoral argument. It's an unethical argument to say, I don't want other people to have the same protections I have unless their protections directly benefit me in my perception. Woo, subjective truth. How the hell do you pass laws and policies based on a subjective perception of my aunt's 
personal security. Let, let me let me re respond, and I, I want then I want to give it to Michael because we, we all want Michael to get in here. Everybody's he's just look at him, man. His wheels are turning. He's ready to pounce. But I, I want to say this: Look, from sort of a philosophical standpoint, I suppose I too wish that we didn't need the Second Amendment. I too wish we didn't need personal firearms. I wish we didn't need the police. I wish we didn't need a military. I wish we lived in a world where everyone got along. And there was never a threat to my life, my wife's life, my family's life, my friend's life. I wish that I could go to any gas station at two in the morning and not have to take my personal consideration into or my personal safety into consideration. I wish that I could walk around nonchalantly at any time and not have to worry about my safety whatsoever. And my family could, too. Those are wonderful wishes. And I think that that's something that everybody could could overall if they're if they're good people could wish for that's not the reality that we live in that's not the reality that any human has ever lived in that's not the reality that any mammal lives in you go out there and pick up any wild animal doesn't matter what it is from the size of a of a squirrel to a go try to catch a zebra or a, a emu or a lion chances are you're going to come out with some scratches if you come out at all they they have personal defenses built in and there's a there's a reason for that because they're threatened every day of their life too. This isn't just a human problem. This is just a world problem. Go try to catch a shark or try even try to catch a catfish. All right. Good chance you're gonna get barbed and you're gonna be hurting for a few days after you grab that catfish if you don't do it right. Pretty much every animal out there has some type of personal defense mechanism built into it to protect it from all the dangers that it's gonna face out there in the world. That's just the way that it is. So here we are, and we do need a second amendment, and we do need to be armed, and we do need to be able to protect ourselves because all we've got to defend ourselves against anything else that's out there really is this brain. We don't have big canines. We don't have giant claws. We don't have armor on our bodies. We don't have poisonous fangs or fins. We have to use this brain to come up with the tools to help us defend ourselves. And we started out with rocks and sticks and spears and swords and bows and arrows, and now we've all got firearms, and that's just the way it is. Go, Mike. Thank you, Bruce. Um, <clears throat> all right, I'm gonna be speaking maybe for a little while, maybe not so long, because you guys brought up a lot of things. So my approach, first off, is I wanna take a little bit like higher level and just in terms of when we see these things occur. I mean, we're all in agreement, right? That, you know, we don't want these mass shootings to happen. We don't want, and we especially don't want another mass shooting ha happening at our schools. Correct. So, um, so first off, you know, when, if I want to analyze like what's going on in this country, you know, and what would be, um, the most effective approach to either reduce or obviously we want a whole hardly stop these uh, these shootings from taking place is that I want to look at, well, what other countries exist in the world that are similar to us and, and both our government and, um, and, you know, what happens there. And so obviously that brings to mind like Western Europe, Canada, you know, countries such as this. And, you know, the first and foremost, the thing that I see is that it, these shootings do not happen uh and the frequency that they occur here all right and i'm not going to pinpoint it to just like one thing of gun laws you know there's other aspects you know we've talked about mental health um and that is another big thing is uh you know i hate this argument of like oh it's mental health no it's guns you know one or the other it's like it can be both and we and we should strive to work to um you know, uh, approach both of a, approach both of these solutions and what would be most effective. So, um, you know, Canada has, um, you know, a, a, a universal health care, um, Western Europe, Western European countries have a universal health care system. Um, Britain has the NIH, um, you know, so this allows access to 
uh, be able to get mental health, to, to be able to get assistance for their citizens readily. And we don't have that here in the States. It's very difficult um, and, and, and very limited. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, read about in the Washington Post is that, you know, most of these mass shootings are like 99% of them are committed by men. And even a further majority of those are committed by teenagers to around like 22 years of age. And scientifically, like the the male brain at that age, um, the the frontal cortex, which has to do with like limiting impulse and whatnot, is just severely like underdeveloped. And and that's why, you know, that's why we drove really fast as kids. That's why we like took risks. You know, it was like, hey, watch me, <laughs> watch this. You know, that type of thing. And um, and so one of uh, you know one of the things is that is of course um, you know if, if obviously we take eighteen year olds into the military but what is that like they're going through thirteen weeks of boot camp certainly going through a lot more training before we even give them a rifle to go into the range and then furthermore you know if they're going into into infantry then they're going to school of infantry training and it's not like you know just that one time training um, it's it's it's, it's happens repeatedly, right? Um, you know, in the Marine Corps, you have to get certified annually on your rifle. Um, it's not like, Hey, you do it once and you're good to go. So, you know, like when Chad mentioned, uh, quoted George Washington saying armed, but disciplined, you know, that's uh, the discipline approach is, is, is the very important part to that. And as a reasonable person, I think that if you want to own a firearm, you know, if you're a private citizen, you want to own a firearm, you should get training on it you, and it should be extensive. It shouldn't be the easiest thing in the world. And not only should it be a one, uh, not once, but it should be a regular thing. Um, because hold on, doc, <laughs> let me go. Why through. Expensive? I, no, but why expensive? I mean, I'm a total no, extensive, agreement. extensive. Oh, extensive. Sorry. My bad. Yeah. Um, but it should be something that you regularly have to get certified because even even cops who are trained you know are are, are civilian protective force um you know they they get training and even when these shooter situations happen and i'm not you know just pointing to uvalde just in general it's even they have a hard time responding to these um types of situations so if uh, a force that is designated for public safety is having issues imagine like i don't want Joe Schmuckatelli, you know, if I'm in an area where there's a mass shooter and, you know, this guy thinks he's John Wayne and he's just, you know, putting rounds down range and, you know, they're 50 yards apart. Um, I, I don't want that. I want common sense gun laws that, um, you know, make it where you're, you have to get training and, and then talking about the impulse, like if you're a good citizen, right? Like I'm a gun owner, right? So I, 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 you know, I, I want to have my handguns. Um, and the thing is, is that if I want to keep that right and, and keep that from going on, then I don't want, and I'm a law abiding citizen. I don't want non law abiding citizens or people who, you know, have mental health issues and are, and are going to, you know, they're having this impulse of like, Hey, I just want to take out a bunch of people and kill myself. I want to have laws in place that would prevent that because, the more that happens, although sadly, you know, still hasn't quite happened in this country, but the more that happens, the more that risks denigrating my right to own a handgun. Um, you know, the moral values argument, I find to be sort of a, a red herring there. Um, one, I don't think you can legislate morality. Two, there's plenty of other countries that have secularism built into their government, namely the French, and, you know, again, don't have these issues. Um, I, I don't think you have to have religion to be, to know right from wrong and treating people well and, and decently. Um, and so I, I think that's, I think it's just one, you know, civility and teaching civics and what's the proper way of, of treating one another is, is first and foremost, and we can do that in our schools without religion. Mike, let me respond on a few things. Uh, I agree with your last point, and maybe I was a little misunderstood. Um, I don't equate morality to religion exclusively. Morality, morality can be taught to a family that is agnostic or atheist, for that matter. Um, good family values, treating people like you would like to be treating, 
avoiding violence, those types of things can, can I, I consider those good moral values, whether there's religion attached to them or not. I think we probably all agree that um, religion typically does attach those values in their preachings, but that doesn't have, you don't have to be a religious family to have good moral values. Um, and, and I, and I think that you said you can't legislate morality. I, I disagree a little bit. There might not should be a law out there stating that you have to be a moral person. Okay. Cause I don't want to go down that slippery slope as to what's a good moral person, but we have a government today that is actively promoting values that are not good moral values. We could just as easily have that same government from the city all the way up promoting good moral values, going out there teaching you that being weird, being strange, being an outcast is not a desirable thing and it's not a good thing and that you should work to comply, to fall within society and be a good, productive, hardworking American. Ooh, with Ayn good, Rand would disagree with you. That, 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 that may be. That the whole country can disagree with me, but, I'm, but my point is this, that, that if you go out there and you don't have to promote religion to promote good family values and, and to promote keeping a family together, to promote being good role models for your children and, and to, again, shame those that do bad things so that they don't want to do bad things. They realize that there's, there's a consequence for, for that beyond just, just having to, I don't know, kill themselves or, or die, go down, die fighting. Cause I think one good point you brought up is that what's something common within a lot of, a lot of these shootings, they're male. Yeah, I agree. They're young. Yeah, a lot of them are. I agree. Um, have we looked at the race of those individuals? I think that that's important. Typically with these school shootings, they're almost all white. This last one wasn't. He was Hispanic. Was he even a he? We can get into that because he, he, he was going through some type of sexual transfer there too and if you believe in women or women too maybe he was a she but he would in, in, in any count he was Hispanic and then this last guy that just went into the uh, the hospital and shot up the hospital that's not a school shooting but it's a mass shooting he was black what about black on black crime that's something we really don't talk about but we have to address if we're looking at overall shootings that are going on within this country they have the more people die in a weekend in Chicago that are typically young black males than die in the average school shooting by a young white male. I think that's something we just have to also look at and we can't completely ignore because and the reason I bring that up is this. I believe that um, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of black victims of violence every year that we just push aside. And we, we don't even care about it. the news doesn't even cover it. They'll cover a school shooting full of white kids or a predominantly white shooter, but they don't cover this black on black crime that's going on also. And there are tons of black children that are dying because of this. And we are doing them an injustice and a disservice by not even factoring that in, by not even covering that and not even looking at that. We need to include those, I think, into the victims of shootings because it doesn't matter whether you're in school and you're a five-year-old and you get shot, or if you're in your home, you get shot by straight in Chicago, your life should count just as much and it should be just as tragic of a, of a loss as, as any other death. And that's something that we completely ignore. The media ignores, the government ignores, a lot of people who talk about these things ignore, whereas they'll cover anytime that it's kids in a school and these are predominantly white kids also. Um, and to, to your last point, um, you suggest we should have extensive training on firearms in order to, in order to own one. Um, I, I support that as a, uh, I, you guys know I support that. I come on here every time, whatever we're talking about, I say, go get more training, go get more training, go get more training. You can never have enough. Of course, the more proficient you are with that firearm, the more safe you're going to be with that firearm and, and the better choices you're going to make at that farm when it comes time to make those choices support that 100 but do we have a government mandate that and i think that that's where it's a step too far do we start having the government mandate restrictions and requirements on our rights and it's a it's a it's a good question and the question is once we do then 
how many people who would normally own a firearm for personal defense, never use it in anger, keep it in their home, would not would be deterred by that training and would not go get it and then therefore would not be able to protect themselves. And particularly, I think about females. Question. Quick question. I, I like it. Agreed. Not fighting with you on that. Would you be in support? Just real quick question. Would you be in so support of government? Let's say the National Guard holds one week in a month where they allow citizens to come in and somehow support, either with their ranges or maybe, God forbid, actually providing ammunition and instruction. Would you be okay with that, Bruce? This is, I would, I would fully support it. I, I would support it and I would come on here and I would promote it. I've done that with private organizations like One Shepherd and even Appleseed. Um, I do that. I, I will tell anybody before, you know, when you purchase a firearm, go get training. Get your CHL, at least get a, the very basic minimum training in Texas in our CHL class. We cover basic laws in the state of Texas where you can and you can't carry and extremely basic firearms uh, uh, drills. Just getting it up and running and trying to hit a piece of paper. That's it. Would I like to see everyone a Navy SEAL when it comes to their proficiency? You bet I would. You, you absolutely bet I would. Would I like to see the federal government create programs to where you could go to your local uh, reserve training ground or whatever the case may be, your local law enforcement agency, and have a day of training with the PD, have a day of training with your military? You bet I would. What Democrat or what government person has come out and suggested that? I've not heard it ever in my lifetime. And again, that tells me that they aren't serious about addressing things like Michael is of training individuals. They certainly have the capabilities. The money's absolutely there. They, they pull ammunition apart by the millions of rounds and disassemble it and sell it off as surplus. Why could they not have a program where people can come with their ARs, for example, and train with the local National Guard, get to learn about your military and learn firearm safe handling? Sure using free ammunition it's just going to be destroyed anyway i'm gonna tell you Bruce, why because it makes too much sense that's damn right what you just said because it makes too much damn sense because it doesn't fit their narrative because it doesn't fit a whole lot of things it doesn't put money in their pocket i mean these are politicians after all but but i mean no it goes far more than that it's far more insidious than that they will take things like apple seed and one shepherd and actively smear them actively smear them as those are militia, internal terrorist organizations. That's it. I mean, these are these are like the CMP, right? I mean, they're like citizen programs in some cases that the government at one time was part of, and saying, "Look, these are very responsible and accountable um, to their society, to their you know, constituency," and now they actively smear them. So when you say, "Will the government help?" No, the government will undercut every effort to create a responsible gun culture. Be why? Well, because it doesn't suit their needs. Again, again, guys, this is, in my opinion, this is not a, this is not a gun uh, problem, right? When they came out with the second amendment and drafted it, it didn't say right to bury arms right unless you know with training <laughs> guns have always been around i don't th they should not be a requirement that you have training no because some 60 year old grandma that just wants to keep her pistol in her house buys it at the local gun store just for self-protection or whatnot i don't she shouldn't have to go to a training class to be able to to purchase that handgun i don't agree with I don't, that whatsoever. i don't i don't i don't get that reasoning brent i i just Neither. i just don't because here's here's the thing that you know, the, the right keeps on saying is that the only thing that's going to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun, right? Which is, assumes that in a situation where a bad guy is shooting at people, that there's going to be a good guy there that's going to step in and put shots on target, right? So in answer to that person who said, do we really want them to have trained and make them more lethal? Fucking A, we do. Yeah, I want this person to put those rounds center mass. I don't want those rounds hitting other bystanders that are running around. and In, Including grandma. I, including grandma, right? Who's going to you know trip on her purse or on a walker and is going to shoot herself in the face 
just like in the out of sight or right um the the military the the marine corps has its core focus is on the firearm and uh, on 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 the m4 and making every round count right it's the reason why at most we use a three round burst but even then we're trained on on single fire right because in vietnam we found and and with automatic rounds were being wasted going through magazines very quickly so even we are trained on single fire and again like to make us an effective fighting force it is drilled into us repeatedly and we're trained repeatedly on it so if grandma wants to buy a handgun in order to defend herself from an intruder does it only make sense that she would want to use that firearm in the most effective manner possible and so therefore and and because as a government we want our good productive citizens to keep on working to contribute to the general economic good and the community wouldn't it be in our interest to make sure that grandma gets the training necessary to be able to handle that firearm properly and 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 not injure herself or someone else that doesn't deserve it like that just seems common sense to me i don't i don't understand well, why anyone so would me, be against let me respond that. to this man you're assuming that grandma's not going to get any type of training i don't trust you or the government mandating that because what does that make what does that make okay now you have the next school shooting after this training requirement gets implemented and they say okay well now you have to do x y and z oh and then you have to have your shot group in this in order to be qualified to do this and then you got to fire the file your form nine and wait for six months and then after that you need to go get fingerprinted oh and then you got to go get two passport photos and it, it's dude it's a snowball okay it's a snowball you're assuming that the grandma's not going to get training i encourage her to go get training i encourage anybody to buy a firearm training okay. I don't trust you or the government in mandating that training okay so brent hold on we're saying this we're all saying the same thing michael and you are actually saying the same thing unless michael corrects me what we're saying is we believe in mandatory training you're saying brent by the way i absolutely agree with you the government has no business in this mandatory but we're all agreeing that training is a critical component to firearm ownership we're all agreeing on this premise what we're not necessarily agreeing is that the government should be involved. If the government's involved, my only at, at here, my point here is that if, if the government's involved, it's evol involved in a proactive, positive way. Here's what I mean. Instead of a negative way, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot, I'm a gatekeeper. You see that? No, no, no. The government I'm saying is, let me make it real simple. The government takes all the surplus ammo that isn't fired by every single unit, right? And makes those available on its reserve and National Guard, um, you know, once a month, makes that ammo available and particularly available to established militia, private militia. And it says, okay, we got nine millimeter ammo and 38 caliber ammo. Does grandma need training on this? Because we have X amount for next month on the you know third thursday of the month this is what i'm trying to say is that if the government's involved at all it's only involved in facilitating this making sure it happens as in with money and ammunition and training space but i am saying this brent if i'm going to sell grandma a 38 caliber revolver i'm going to say hey grandma show me your um show me your ownership to a uh to a gun club oh you don't have one well then Here's the thing, that $350 revolver just became $400 unless you can show me that you're trained on it. But if you're not trained on it, you get a $50, I will train you. You see what I did as the seller? I'm going to train you on that, even if you don't show up. I'm going to sell you the course. And I'm not doing this because the government mandated it. I'm doing it because it's the morally correct thing to do. Grandma. The $350 revolver costs $400 unless you show me you're already trained. Oh, you show me? It's $350, Grandma. Let me respond to Michael real quick because, Michael, you, you kind of said two things. One I take issue with, one I completely agree with. You said that if Grandma, we'll use her as an example, Grandma goes out and buys this handgun. You said she's going to want to get trained on that handgun. What's stopping her from going out and getting trained on that handgun? 
there's there's tens of thousands of classes available every single weekend throughout the country and pretty much so any oh. state that you go any gun store that you go to any larger gun store they have some type of chl or personal protection class available so she absolutely can go out and if she wants to get that training get that training i support you 100 percent on that i'm with you i'm on board what I'm not on board with is saying before you can buy this gun or in order to purchase this gun, you have to go to some type of mandatory training and get some type of certification that the government's providing. We've all been to government training programs. All right. I'm getting ready to go through a, a TSA screening for my background. It's a giant pain in the ass. I just re up my commission core, my commission cards with the state of Texas, giant pain in the ass. I've got multiple tax stamps. Giant pain in the ass. You want you want to go. You want to go. You want for firearm owners to be what you have to do to get a driver's license to go stand in that line. What a giant pain in the ass. That's not efficient. And I've made this argument before. Our government doesn't do anything well. We shouldn't be giving them more things to do. Uh, so, um, oh, there was one other point that I wanted to make. I'll come back to it. But to to address those issues, I agree. oh, here's the point, Grandma. Guys, grandma's not going out there shooting up schools. Grandma's not the problem here. Grandma's I, not. Come on. That's, on that's, that's just where we started because someone well, used as an let, example. Let, it's not let, let me literal. It. Let, me, let me broaden it, Michael, because I know that wasn't your point. Let me broaden it. Yeah. Legal firearm owners that are, are want to get more training and want to have a firearm for personal defense, they're not the problem here. They're not the problem in any of these school shootings. They're not the problem in hardly any of these shootings. If a legal firearm owner who, who is purchasing that firearm for personal offense misuses that firearm, we have courts and, 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 and processes in place for that person. We can, we can follow those court cases every day. They're out there. And many times those people get punished if they've made a bad decision. That's not what we're really talking about here. What we're talking about is, is mass violence within inner city communities, school shootings, Th those those aren't people that are going out buying firearms for the right reasons. Those are people that have firearms for the wrong reasons and are set mentally on doing evil. Okay. Oh, Chad, Les, are you guys going? Well, go ahead if you guys want to say real quick. Oh, you know, I never have something to say real quick. Um, well, so, Bruce, my, my question to your point about what's preventing them from getting training after they purchase it do you would you agree that there that it is possible for an irresponsible person to purchase a handgun now or any weapon for that matter sorry i agree myself i would i would agree yes okay so you would agree so that is my point right there i'm not worried about the responsible person that's going to do the right thing and you know get a handgun go get the training go get more training to make sure they're proficient. I'm worried about, again, Joe Schmuckatelli that thinks he's going to be dirty hairy and just wants to get a bunch of guns because his dick is too small. All right. That's the person that I want to have that mandatory training for and to make sure that they're going to go through the motions to, to do it. And if it's someone that just wants to do it to be able to like show off and say like, Hey, I got this handgun, that type of person I would hope one is getting is, is going to be deterred by that. Um, and, you know, not wanting to get it for just the flash of saying like, hey, look at this cool Glock I got. Second, the other thing that that Democrats and we haven't broached this part, but this even this is even a lower requirement than what I'm talking about from from a training is uh, just having a mandatory background check on all firearm sales. That already exists. That argument's not, over not between with Michael. private citizens. I'm an FFL. And yes, it is. Here in Virginia, it is absolutely required between private citizens. Okay. If I go and give my gun to Doc and say, this is yours, and I take $300 for him, I've got a felony. That law is in place. The background checks have been in place. Is it and, a oh, national? Oh, by the way, the background checks don't work. Is I'll it give a you a national? prime example. Yeah. Dylan Roof in South Carolina, when he shot up that church, the FBI approved him when they shouldn't. The director had to walk out and go, oopsie, when it's over, and all those people are dead. It's yeah. a thing. It makes people feel good. But, you know, most of the time when people get delayed, it comes back OK. You know, I've been an FFL for 11 years now. I've never had a person flat out denied. 
Background checks don't work. It's just a solve to make us feel good after the less. And so one it would be to make it a national law. That's great that it's a it's a law in Virginia. Two, I'm not saying that it's absolutely going to solve the problem, but again, the goal is is that we want good people, law-abiding citizens, to be able to purchase weapons, and we want non-law-abiding citizens or those who have the potential to break the law or those with like mental health issues to not be able to get one or at least have some sort of delay or something so we can make sure that everything is done accordingly. Again, as a law-abiding citizen, I want that to be the case. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with, because the one of the other dictums, you know, the reason why we form government in the first place is to provide for public safety, right? Whether it's you're at a county level, a city level, a state level, or at the federal level, right? We have a we have a military to provide protection for the nation as a whole. We have local law enforcement to protect us from there. So um, that that is my urging there in terms of you know why why we need to have these protections in place. Can, can I say two things real quick? I'm going to go to Chad. Um, one, to my knowledge, the last three big shootings where we had was was Uve. We had the racist kid killing poor people in New York, and we had the, the black guy that went and shot up the hospital in Tulsa. All three had background checks. All three passed them. Okay. Most Let of these. Because in 2017, I went to a conference put on by the Virginia State Police and the ATF, and they uh, illuminated a pretty big fact. And there are 21 databases that when an, a background check is done, it can be checked. Virginia checks the most, checking 14. They used to check all 21 until the ACLU got a hold of them, saying seven of the ones they were checking was a HIPAA violation. The states that uh, ban guns the most, California, Illinois, Connecticut, they check three databases, and that's it. Right there, when you want a solution to check all the databases. And that's, yeah, we're in that agreement. doesn't require a new law. Awesome. That doesn't require anything. That requires probably just spending a little bit of money. I, I do think I do think in agreement with the three of you that one of the one of the arguments that even the right has um, that you see commonly come up is when um, laws are on the books, they should be enforced. Enforced, and that hasn't been that hasn't been happening um, in many cases. There's many things we can do to make those laws um enforced and better and communication between different government agencies happened and just like les was was saying that's not happening that should be happening and until we get those things in order why would be we be creating new laws to compound those problems i'm sorry chad i'm going to relinquish the rest of my time to you <laughs> all right well uh, michael i want to go back a little bit to something you said um you know no you don't have to have religion to be a moral person but Doc made the point, you need to replace it with something. We don't have anything in place. Can you say that again? We I didn't catch that. I'm sorry, Chad. Okay. You don't have to have religion. You're right. To be a moral person. You don't, you can't really dictate morals. You're right. Okay. But when we've taken away our moral foundation from, say, schools, we haven't replaced it with anything. That's the point that Doc made. Okay. We don't teach ethics in schools. You don't have to have religion, but there's some kind of ethical, common ethical background that we have to have. Okay, what what about the kids that aren't getting ethics at home? You know, maybe we need to incorporate some ethics into our, you know, lower grades in school. I don't know. But there's got to be some kind of uh, ethical, philosophical foundation that we all have to have or we will go the way of the Roman Empire. Okay, that's one. But I want to kind of move over to something, uh, you know, Doc wanted some disagreement here. Um, and I can't believe I'm about to say this, but Brent, in your opening statement, you made some 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 comments that I got to disagree with, brother. Um, first and foremost, you said that uh, school shootings aren't really a, a, an epidemic nowadays. Um, I've got some, statist uh, some stati blah, 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 statistics up that show that the rate of school shootings has sl slowly inclined, at least from the 1980s. Okay, we, we do see a, a major incline especially from 2010 to now. So um, it's obviously gone up a little bit at least. Um, I also want to say I don't necessarily agree 
with the statement that the that so-called assault weapons aren't weapons of war. I think they are weapons of war, but I don't have a problem with that at all. Um, let me explain. Okay, we, we need to finally answer that question that Democrats keep asking. Why does a civilian need an AR-15 or an AK-47? We always avoid this question on the right because the answer is extremely uncomfortable. Um, the truth is simple. Democrats make the claim that so-called assault weapons, which on a side note, the term assault weapon is a phrase that became prevalent during World War II by the Nazis who manufactured a rifle that correlates to the modern assault weapon, the STG-44 Sturmgewehr, which translates into storm gun, you know, further translation, attack gun or assault gun. So next time some lefties, you know, wants to throw out assault weapon, just let them know they're using fascist language. See how that, see how that turns out. But anyway, the Dems make two assertions. One is that these are weapons of war. And when I hear this, I shake my head in agreement. You're right. They are weapons of war. And the right in this country is preparing for war against the left. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not promoting violence, okay? That's not what I'm doing here. I don't think we're anywhere near the point where violence is necessary. This is still a cold civil war, and I'm perfectly fine with keeping it that way. However, the butt. Oh, however. conservatives <laughs> see the writing on the wall. The right believes war with the left is coming. Right-wingers see a totalitarian tendencies of the Democrats and the left in America. I'm talking about events like the IRS scandal under Obama, where the Dems use the power of the government to attempt to target conservative organizations. We have a left who, in 2008, 2009, attempted to revive the Fairness Doctrine, which would allow them to silence conservative voices, especially in talk radio. We now have a left who wants to establish a so-called Ministry of Truth, where they get to decide what is disinformation or misinformation. Yeah, there's no way that won't get misused. We have a prevalence of cancel culture on the left. We have a left that wants to take away the filibuster and pack the Supreme Court when they don't get their way. We have a left who threw a fit in 2000 when they lost. And again, in 2016, we have a left high on unearned moral superiority that is hell-bent on establishing a single-party system in this country. We have a left that wants to give the government a monopoly on force. Like Doc said, democide has been the greatest killer of humanity since the beginning of time. So yes, there are weapons of war. And the right is preparing for war with the left. Secondly, they say these weapons are designed to kill a lot of people. Yep, they are. Absolutely. If you're at war, taking out as many of the enemy as possible is a primary characteristic of victory. Not to mention the tactical ability to lay down suppressive fire to allow for maneuver. The Kyle Rittenhouse incident proves my point. If you have 30 plus Antifa fuckheads coming at you with the intent to end your life, and I have a magazine of 30 rounds, I'm going to neutralize that situation fairly quickly before I have to reload. Well, I'm going to go down a slightly say... different tact here. What's one thing all the school shootings have in common? The school. Maybe the gun's not the problem. Maybe it's the school. These happen in public schools. They do not happen in private schools. They do not happen with homeschoolers. They do not happen in uh, religious schools. They happen in public schools. They also happen to be in very overcrowded public schools. And the persons always looked over. In each of these cases, um, things are looked over because it always comes out that, oh, darn, yeah, we always thought that kid was nuts. Oh, he wasn't right. Oh, the school staff knew there was a problem with this kid. This always comes out. The one I always go back to, the, the most extreme example, was back in 1999. There was a naval officer here in Washington at Bethesda. He got transferred to San Diego, and his kid went in and shot up the school. It was a horrible, random school shooting until all his friends back here in Maryland started uh, emailing the local TV station telling how he got his ass kicked every day, how the teachers wouldn't do anything about it. And it just so happens the random school shooting took out the exact kids who beat the crap out of him every day. You know, I think a big part of the problem is the schools itself. And following up yeah, on that, I mean, reiterate what I said there. The homeschoolers are not having this problem. The private schools are not having this problem. The church schools are not having this problem. Maybe the problem is the school and not the gun. Yeah, I think that's where we're uh, headed next is, uh, you know, I think where that's where Brent's going to take us. But before he goes, just let me jump in there. 
because I'm going to say that I agree with Chad on this one, Brent. Uh, I think when you said it's not a weapon of war, I get that it's a semi-auto. It is not a full auto. It is not a select fire. It is not an M16, an AR-15, and any of those semi-autos aren't those things. Are they weapons of war? The ninth U.S. Ninth Circuit of Court, uh, Circuit Court, I think it was a year or two years, I can't remember if it was last summer or the summer before, when they ruled against the Ninth Circuit Court, mind you, the most liberal U.S. court in the land, ruled against the California, California Magazine ban, said two things, and they're very, very critical. It said to California for their arguments, number one, you said that a 30-round magazine is excessive, it is common in use, and it is part of the AR-15 weapon system. That's what they said. We disagree with you because it is common in use, and it is part of the AR-15 weapon system. Second thing that Ninth Circuit liberal court, or at least with a liberal history of rulings, said is that California claimed the AR-15 is a, quote, weapon of war. The Ninth Circuit Court agreed with them and said, California, this doesn't work in your favor. Stop arguing this point. It is, the AR-15 is a weapon of war. And for that reason alone, the AR-15 is appropriate for private ownership for forming into private militia. Let me say that again. The U.S. Ninth Circuit Court said the AR-15 is a weapon of war, and that is why it is appropriate for private ownership. Okay. <laughs> so I'll have to go back and watch what I said. Uh, obviously, words have meaning. Um, absolutely. If, if civil war breaks out tomorrow or there's a freaking massive crowd outside my house protesting or whatever and trying to break in, I'm going to use my AR-15 to exterminate that threat because it is the most lethal weapon system that I own in my wet, my little safe over there. Yep. Uh, what I was trying to make is I constantly see politicians, particularly on the left, equate that the AR-15 that's in the hands of a everyday civilian, right, is the same one that's being used on the battlefield of Afghanistan and Iraq. That is absolutely not the case. And that's what they're trying. That's the image that they're trying to portray into yeah. the vast majority of the un uneducated, right, the ones that believe that 9 millimeter bullets can blow – you know, stomachs out of people's bodies. Anyways, I what I want to get to, uh, because we've talked about essentially the same topic for about an hour now, a little, actually over an hour. Um, I want to go back to the schools. How do we protect schools or any location for that matter where these uh, mass shootings are taking place? We've seen them at um, concerts. We've seen them at movie theaters. Uh, the schools are the most disheartening in our opinions because, you know, we're talking about young minds being wasted. Um, how do we how do we protect those locations? So again, in my opinion, this is not a gun problem, and we can talk about you know culture and and all this stuff, guys. We have the culture we have, all right. We have we're always going to have mental health issues. Every country in the world has mental health issues. They're out there, okay. How do we protect these locations from these individuals? Okay, so I'm going to go back to the thing that I stated earlier, which is. <clears throat> we look at other similar countries to our own and they don't have this these issues that we do and we all agree that they have people with mental health issues just like just like we do right we're no different there um so why is it that these other countries don't have these issues and yet we do like these other countries don't have to harden their schools in the in the level that we're about to go into, where, where, why, where are you pulling that? Just uh, that's a that's a bold claim. Where are you getting that information? Because my information says exactly the opposite. What is your information, Doc? My information says that schools are vulnerable. When you look at the several knife wielding attacks, let's just take one country, China. Several knife. I wasn't comparing to China, by the way. I okay, said Western countries of our own, but but, but wait, but Australia is Australia similar to us? I mean, yeah, let's yeah. let's be honest. Economically, we're a little different than Australia, size-wise, demographic, <laughs> geographic, and certainly their uh, social system where we're a democratic uh, republic. So there are differences, and there, we're never going to get an apples to apples. So Michael, I'm not going to call you on that one because I get called on that all the time. You'll never get an apples to apples comparison. Fair enough. 
But what I am saying is Australia does have gun slaughtering and mass shootings, but particularly slaughtering of schools. They did, and they still do. And they have other types. They've had bombings, fires. Um, let's see. I mean, just you name it. Now, it does it happen. You said earlier you hit the nail on the head. You didn't say they don't because I started to object and you went, you said the words with the same frequency as America. And I went, ooh, I'm backing off because you, you're correct. They don't have it with the same frequency. But they, in fact, do have all sorts of attacks on schools. Then you take a country like Israel, not like America at all, because several things, Israel's in a perpetual state of war. Israel, in spite of the fact that they have guns galore, is an anti-gun, a strictly, Les will back me up on this, a strictly anti-gun nation, very, very anti-personal ownership of firearms, and I forgive people for not knowing that because it doesn't look like it. But the guns you see are government and, you know, owned or private security owned. And yet here's what Israel did. They realized that, Michael, they realized that their elementary schools or their schools were incredibly vulnerable to terrorism. And they realized this back in the 19, late 1970s. And instead, this anti-gun nation, anti-Second Amendment nation said, we're going to harden our schools. We will find ways, and we can discuss those in detail. We will harden our schools to disrupt and thwart and deter terrorist attacks against our schools. Doc, your, your example is invalid. Um, and I'll tell you why. It's because the threat is from the outside, not from the interior. What's going on here in the United States is U.S. citizens attacking other U.S. citizens. Israel is hardening their targets against the Palestinians and the and the PLO and and whomever. Um, and but, you no, know, no, they're they're hardening their targets against their own people. I, I don't know where you're getting that. It's not Jordanians or Egyptians attacking their schools. It's Israelis attacking Israeli schools. Almost, almost, you know, not not entirely. You're right. There's some external stuff, but no, it, this isn't the Gaza Strip that's attacking their schools. It's Israelis attacking Israeli schools. I don't know where you're getting your information. I don't know where you're getting your information from because I, I have not heard anything of, of that. Why, why, does someone else have their not muted? It's Docs. If Docs' is, uh, mic isn't muted, it echoes. Oh, sex robot. It is a sex robot thing. <laughs> She's underneath right. the table, so you can't see her. <laughs> Did you so, say he... The larger point being, right, is that, I mean, schools in in Europe, you know, we're going, we're about to, you know, Brent was bringing us into let's harden schools, you know, uh, Senator, um, uh, not Cornyn, the other one from Texas, why am I blanking? Guys, help me out. Talking about Cruz? Cruz, thank you. You, you were Cruz. referring to him as the honorable Senator Cruz. <laughs> I don't think he's a judge. And I, I, I called him by his title. <laughs> um, Senator Cruz, you know, is suggesting of having, you know, one door of entry um, and, uh, you know, other other things like that. Again, it just begs the question is like, why do we have to go through these when other countries don't have these types of protections as necessary? Again, and I, no one's some people are misconstruing my words as saying like, oh, no attacks ever happen in the public in any of these other countries. I'm not saying that they do, um, but also a lot of them are like knife wielding, things of that nature. They just don't have the the lethality and again, frequency of what we have here. So I would like to examine, it would, it would bear reminding it was like, let's examine what they have in place to see what we can do to help here. And the thing that I just don't like is that it's just with our politicians, it's just like a non-starter conversation. Like we can't even agree to have the, the, the conversation, you know, Les got pretty upset when I mentioned background checks. Okay. Like you want to make some points about some efficacy of background checks. Fine. All right. But let's at least have the conversation. And there's just no conversation, no committee, public committee hearings about, what we can do, what we can uh, to to stop these from happening, but we have to do something. Um, that's just, you know, 
this it can't keep on going like this it's just it's just insane and and talking about you know statistics if i may share like one more thing um you know there's the argument for um shoot how the fuck do i do this sorry part of my language um are you guys seeing this it's a family show michael yeah i i know i apologize sex robots um are you guys are you guys seeing this window right here yes so we can see it. Yeah. yeah so this number right here in terms of largest number of incarceration per capita per hundred thousand the united states is at the very top and that really gives me pause. You know, when you look at the uh, the countries that are right below it, El Salvador, Turkmenistan, Palau, Rwanda, Cuba, Maldives, the Virgin Islands, UK, Thailand, Bahamas, this, this really saddens me. And the first thing that I take away is like, you know, we want to talk about, you know, uh, the United States being a, a leader, a, a, a beacon on the hill, you know, that, that Reagan quoted uh, Winthrop um, on. I don't find this. I don't not. I'm not that proud of this statistic. And why do you hate, why do you hate winning, Michael? <laughs> you consider this winning because here's the thing: is that there's always been that long time argument that, like, you know, stricter. You know, all we need to do is get tough on crime, and that will that will negate crime. And I'm not saying like there shouldn't be any laws against doing you know wrong things, but what I'm saying is is that clearly like putting more people in prison is not a, an effective deterrent against people committing more crime and you know bruce you had said like hey we have a court system to like address um you know these types of these types of things well yes we do but the issue there is that it happens after the fact after the damage has been done if someone mishandles or misuses their weapon so i don't find it to be an effective deterrent let's you know let's make it before they get the gun of 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 making sure that the right people um, are, you know, are, are getting it that are going to be responsible gun owners. All right, so guns are out there. How do we hurt in schools? How do we hurt in schools? All right, let me. So you're you're, you're talking about gun free zones here, I, I think, um, and that that's always been a preferred target of these shooters. So why is that? Well, the answer is simple. There's no resistance that's going to be offered in a gun free zone. That be a hospital, a school, whatever. You know, even the shooting at Fort Hood, Texas. You know, our military bases, believe it or not, are gun-free zones. You can't have a gun on base unless you're in training. So the shooting in Buffalo, hell, the entire state of New York is a gun-free zone, virtually. Take this latest incident in Texas, okay? After killing his grandmother, the shooter wrote on social media that he planned to shoot an elementary school before he actually did it. Why did he pick an elementary school? Why exactly did he feel that this location would be an ideal place where he could easily execute his plan? Well, we all know the answer. So because some idiot, big-hearted, small brain politician back in 1990 thought it would be a good idea to establish gun-free zones. Hospitals are another gun-free zone. And now we have another shooting in Tulsa, Oklahoma at a hospital. Why exactly do these shooters seem to flock to gun-free zones? Chad, why did the 9-11 attackers, the 19 terrorists that went on 9-11, why didn't they why didn't they hijack any military airplanes? Why did they suspiciously no military, no police, no uh you know Coast Guard airplanes? No, they only attacked unarmed civilian airplanes. I just can't figure it out. Why do yeah, you think they did? Astonishing, isn't it? Now the pattern just is right there. So no, I'm gonna try to get us back on track. I'm I'm a little confused by Michael, um, because my, Michael, you you, you kind of stated that um, you started talking about incarcerations as if that wasn't really the the answer, and I'm trying to figure out where you're going with that because as we brought up mental health issues, I think you said that was a red herring. So I'm con I'm confused. Um, and let me one more thing to that. You, we talked about training. Um, training in order to, to, to get, obtain a firearm. So let's think about the, the last three individuals well, because it's just fresh on my mind. The black guy that went into the hospital and then the, the, the black neighbor uh, uh, a supermarket that was shot up uh, by, by the white kid and then the Hispanic kid that goes in and shoots up the school in Juve. Um, do we want them more trained? I'm confused by that. Did we want them having more training so they could better hit center body mass? Because, because when we 
think about firearm training. We're not talking about a psych exam. We're talking about proficiency training. So I'm confused. I'm confused on that whole thing. And I will let you respond, Michael. But I, I do want to stay focused on um, the, the hardening of schools. And all I got to say right now is this. Um, I understand where like some people are coming from saying like one entry into a school, one way in, one way out. There, there are problems with that because we do that at work, at my work. And, and our protective, our security department likes that because we're focused on um, anyone wanting to come into the building that wants to harm somebody, what we call a violent intruder. Some people would call it an active shooter. We call it a violent intruder because we know they can have any kind of weapon, bomb, knife, whatever. We want to control that. And that's good from a armed security standpoint. It's bad from a fire standpoint. If the, it's it's bad from if someone's inside the building, everybody needs to get out standpoint. So there are, there are issues with that. I can understand why we want to control one point of entry, but I don't think it's realistic in a lot of schools. I've seen a lot of people bring this up where there's big campuses with multiple multiple levels of of, of entry and egress. Get it? Okay, that's that's a that's a tough one to follow. But I just think about this. I'm um. I drive by this school every day when I get off work and there's these little five, six, seven year old kids and, and, and they're in a chain link fence and that's their playground. And they're out there, they're playing in this little chain link fence. Right. And I, it always brings a smile to my face because one, I got to slow my ass down because it's like a, it's like a 20 mile per hour speed limit. But then two, it gives me time to look over at, at these little kids all playing together. They're all different colors. They're having fun. They don't care. It's just a beautiful, a, a beautiful microcosm of America. I hate to see that taken away from them because any bad guy could jump that fence and just go to work. These kids are completely unable to protect themselves in any way whatsoever. They're just little kids. They've got one female teacher there watching them, making sure they don't bite one another. And that's about probably the limit of her training, right? If someone evil wanted to jump that fence and go to work on those poor kids, they absolutely could. But there's beauty in those kids being able to go out and play on the playground. And I remember when I was little, I love to just run wild like a wild Indian. It's probably not PC these days, but back in my time it was. You could run wild on the playground and play off all the kids and jump on the monkey bars and all of this stuff, right? I don't know, man, where I'm going with that. All I'm saying is that I hate to see that, that chain link fence turn into some kind of wall with, uh, with machine gun nests on each corner and barbed wire across the top just to protect these kids while they play on the play playground. I, I hate, I hate Bruce, to see our country go into that. Bruce, I, I have to disagree with you on that one. First off, being a kid that grew up with helicopters and tanks and machine gun barbed wire towers, I loved it. I friggin' loved it. I'm not even joking. My dad in Germany, because of the Red Brigade, the terrorist Red Brigade that blew up school buses, my dad, of all things, you, you always rode to school with an armed guard. There was a soldier there that was armed. And I remember being proud when it was my dad's day and looking up at that going, my dad's on my school bus, man. How awesome is this? He's friggin' armed. That was just totally cool. I love machine guns and helicopters and the whole thing. So I don't think that it's as traumatic to kids as you think it is, unless, you know, I'm a weirdo, which, okay, maybe it is traumatic. Anyway, the point is um, that, you know, uh, Michael said he wants the bad guys to be able to hit center mass. So do I. Have you seen drive-bys? Have you seen bad guys who can't shoot? It's freaking terrible. I want bad guys that can hit other bad guys, first off. Secondly, I want good guys who can, in turn, once half the bad guys are dead on scene, can shoot the remaining bad guys. So, And I want my dad to do it. So there you go. Well, I would go one step further using the Israeli example. My daughter went over there a few years ago on a summer college course and w working with the IDF. And one of the things that she told me every afternoon when there was recess at school, the kids would go out and a platoon would go out too to surround the school just to keep th threats at bay. Um, sometimes you got to keep the wolves out and sometimes you have to use measures you don't want to use to keep them safe. I'm all about hardening the schools and specifically in Uvalde, there's this all this conjecture about this open door the guy used to get in. I'd really like to know if that door was left open intentionally. I'd like to know why it was open. Maybe it was somebody being just stupid and it was an opportunity that the person could take advantage of. You know, 
the, if we're going to harden our schools, then we have to obey by the rules of keeping them hardened. Because if we leave the gate open after putting it up, it doesn't do any good. Hey, Les, let me ask you this. Would you rather 50% and, and you'd have like, I'm, I'm talking quotas here, I'm talking quotas, 50 or 50% 50 of your, of your teachers, elementary, middle school, high school, college, 50% of them have to be gun-toting, qualified shooters. How, how about they can't that? meet the qualification. I don't see how they, I can trust them to be teaching my kids anything. See, there you go. Like 50% of them can be kumbaya, stinky hippies, you know, that haven't washed in three years. That's fine. And, and they're talking, you know, that atheist crap and all this stuff and how they're transgender, uh, uh, you know, dolphin. That's, that's fine. As long as the other 50% are like friggin' armed to the teeth, you know, with camouflage down their face. And they're like, let me tell you how you kill dolphins. You know, I, that's what I want. <laughs> In my, that's what I want for my kids. Who am I kidding? I'm Catholic. I want my priest to be talking like that. I want my priest strapped and teaching mass, you know, and giving mass over an open fire, you know, at one shepherd with, you know, his carbine on his back going kumbaya, you know. I mean, yeah, I would love to see America go to 50% of teachers armed to the friggin' teeth. I want to give them M67 fragmentation grenades. Let me let me doc wait, go to wait, can I not respond to like yes, doc putting yes. the words in my mouth? <laughs> yes, Michael. I saw that. And I and I want to point a question to you, Michael. And I'll and I certain we will certainly want you to respond. But you seem to support gun ownership in America. I noticed you kind of pointed out handguns, and I let that slide. You also seem to focus on training being a part of that, looking at hardening school zones. Um do you support the, um, not requirement, but we'll say encouragement of teachers to be both armed and well-trained in a school system? Well, Bruce, so, and that's what I was going to touch upon. I would say that this conversation is uh, a reaction to the symptom rather than a discussion on the prevention of the symptom in the first place. Oh, poor Chad, he's shaking his head. But kind of think about, you know, your physician and your personal health, right? Doctor says, hey, don't eat too much red meat. We still do. But don't eat too much red meat because, you know, you're going to have clog your arteries and then blah, blah. So then you do eat too much red meat, clogging your arteries. And it's like, well, here's some Lipitor for your cholesterol. And you better do like some freaking exercise to, to, and cut back. We still don't do it. But all those things that he's saying after you've already developed those issues, that's treating the, the, the symptoms, not preventing the problem. My area of view is like, let's prevent the problem and be healthy, America. Um, that that would be my response. Uh, but but to we, we not, are talking, not, talking about, to answer we your are second about question. hardening schools. I know. And so I'm we're talking about hardening there. schools. I'm getting there. So I would... I would think, and I, I feel like this is a safe assumption, that educators get into the job of educating uh, for the purpose of teaching, right? That is, that's what they want to focus on. That's, you know, they want to get the, the best out of their students. Um, I don't think they go into that job having to get certified on carrying a handgun and for, and then hopefully not have to come to the decision of, shooting one of their pupils uh, in the head um, and to prevent it because I could also find that to be a very difficult situation. Here you have a, you know, someone that you see every day and if it's a child in your classroom, I would, I would find that especially difficult. And again, that's the role of the police force is to provide protection um, for- Is it? Uh, for the public, isn't it? I mean, is that not the role of, of police is to protect and is serve? There, is there a requirement for them to go in and act if there's an active shooter in a school? Yes, it, yes there no, is. No, there's not. Is it, I'm sorry, Michael, there's not. Isn't Constitu that <laughs> Constitutionally, there's not. There's not a requirement for them to go in and act. They can stand around with their hands in their pockets if they choose to do so. 
They okay. <laughs> well, if that's the case, then you would need to elect a new police chief because I think the expectation from the public would be go in there and save my kids. Yeah. And if you're saying we shouldn't have that expectation, Bruce, then holy shit! Like I don't know. No, no, no. <laughs> I think I think the expectation very much is there, Michael. I'm totally okay. in agreement. Bruce is correct. If I'm not mistaken, I forget which district court and a series of courts upheld it. Um, said that the police are not ob obligated to die for your child. Well, then, Bruce, it's a moot point that you brought up that uh, brought that as a question. If you agree with me on the on the premise, no, should... because I'm not talking about law enforcement. Listen, if I'm a bad guy and I choose to go into a school and kill a bunch of kids, and I walk into that classroom, I shoot the teacher, I lock the door behind me. If my kid is in that school, I do not want to have to wait on police to respond. Put the formulate a plan, figure out what's going on, and rescue my kid. Anybody in that area, law enforcement or not, available to protect and save my kid, I want them to respond immediately, including myself. If some bad guy comes in my house, I'm not going, yo, 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 time out, time out, time out, time out. I've got 911 on the line. Cops are just three minutes out and they're gonna smoke your ass. Just sit tight. That's not that's not reasonable, man. That's not the way it goes down. They come in my house, they get 12 gauge double lock buck nine pellet to the chest, which I am trained on, Michael. And then the police show up and the police can respond accordingly. But that's just I just don't think you're being reasonable. I don't Bruce. think in this day and age it's reasonable to say that if if an if something goes on inside a school or anywhere else. The police are the only potential possible response to anyone doing anything to stop the execution of those children. And I think Uvalde, Uvalde is the perfect example of that. It is, it is, it is, no matter which way you cut it, whatever excuses you make, it was like 40 to 50 minutes before they entered that school and engaged that person. That's too long when you've got an active shooter inside of a classroom with a bunch of little kids. Bruce, bring it down a minute. Bring it down. Like that's a, like a high emotional. And so I get what you're saying. And let me say it a different way. Sort of analogous, but not that analogous. If there's a fire, Michael, in my el my kids' elementary school, if there's a fire, I, I need to run in and rescue them, not wait for the for the fire department. And and I, I tell you, I years ago read about a, a father who ran in saved one child, ran back into a fire, saved a second child, ran back into the fire, died with the third child. And everybody went on and on about, you know, different, different emotional feelings about that. And I said, my God, if I was that father, could you leave your third child behind? No, that father did the one thing that fathers do. The one thing, I, I love this man, never met him in my life. I love him. I love him. He ran into the fire and died with his last child because he said, I will not live without my last child. Forget the guns for a second, Michael. Forget it, Bruce. Fire. I'm not going to wait for firemen to come rescue my children. Uh, I, I don't find those to be analogous. Um, because the main question that that you guys point out was asking about teachers and and training on the on the gun thing, which is a completely like unique situation in and of itself. All right, the teachers do get training in terms of like, okay, if you want to use the fire thing, the teachers do get training on like, hey, we all remember self fire drills, right? But self defense is needs to be trained. Look, I'm I'm totally with you, Michael, well, on firearms, but self defense. Like an, an innate human response needs to be trained. No, I'm I'm talking about in terms of the 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 arming aspect. I mean, sadly, we do have they do have shooter drills. I mean, thank goodness. Like, I I I'm not young enough to know like what that's like in schools, and 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 I don't have uh, you know kids in 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 school, so I don't know what you know what that go through. You know, my biggest thing was tornado drills when I was growing up. And, and that was it. But um, what I'm saying is that, you know, there's active shooter drills, which, you know, obviously is going to cause a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of uh, stress and, and 
and trauma on, on, on the kids just having to go through and worrying about that. But the other aspect is you can train the, the teacher in order to like, hey, here's what we do to prevent a shooter from getting in, you know, locking the door. You know, now there's like cabinets that are specifically designed to have like bulletproof, you know, uh, doors and go in there, um, that type of stuff. But in terms of the firearm aspect, I think that teachers in general would object to having to do that. Um, because again, it's, it's, um, it, it would, the, just the thought of them having to take out one of their own children, one of their own pupils is a, a bit of a step too far. And again, I would expect, you know, we do have school resource officers, um, on campus. Um, you know, you can make the argument of like elevating that and having more school resource officers, but again, like. You know, Bruce, in, in terms of mentioning like the, the response by the Uvalde police, I, you know, it is both an argument on the that is a, on the right and on the left of that can kind of you know make their view. And the reason why I say that is that, you know, yeah, they waited an hour. And from what I read in the Washington Post, they had just gotten active shooter training um, like yeah. a month or so prior. And so that was not was part fresh of their SOP. mind, and they were fully yeah. trained. It wasn't part of their SOP, and also, you know, they, despite being a small town, they did have like a reserve SWAT force, and despite all of these things, and they did not go in. So, and yeah, like you said, Doc, you know, parents were like screaming, like, "Let me go in there," and yep. you know, they they weren't allowing them to go in there. My I can goodness. see. Re hold on, hold on. I can see reasons as to why they do that. And, and kind of talking about the fire thing, it's like, I understand as a parent also, but as uh, you know, fire marshals wouldn't allow, you know, if there was a fire on a building, I don't think they would allow a parent to go in there as they're trying to put out the fire and send in fire firemen and women with the proper PPE um, to be able to, uh, you know, get in and, and get people out. So um, you can have a debate about that. I'm not saying you're absolutely wrong or right, but I'm just saying. I don't disagree with you. I, if I was the fire marshal, Michael, I would say the same thing. If I would tell my firemen, hold these people back, because now I'm going to, instead of just rescuing children from the school, I'm going to be rescuing parents, right? So I get right. what you're saying, and I'm not saying you're entirely wrong. Let me ask you this on another, going back. So here's, here's the thing. I know a dozen, ed, I know two dozen educators, public school, private school, colleges and universities, all the way down to edu, um, elementary I know two dozen educators in my life, family, including myself. I didn't know. I don't know if you know it. I'm an educator, uh, not in a public school, but that doesn't matter. Uh, of, of two dozen educators, half of them either wanted to go to school armed or did quietly, secretly against the rules. Half of them did. Now, if you want to break that up by gender, I will admit that more males did than females, but don't think that it was only males. I know pretty little petite, you know, adorable 28-year-old second grade teachers that went to uh, school every single day with a 38 revolver with hollow point rounds packed in and trained on how to use it. So here's the point is that I would agree with you that half of the educators I know would not only say that if they were forced to be armed, they would quit, but also... The majority of them would argue if they knew their colleagues were armed, they would quit their profession. So there's certainly half of them out there from my very tiny little anecdotal evidence. But the other half, having PhDs all the way down to bachelor's degrees, males and females, not only said, do I want to be armed? They said, it's so important to me to be armed that I'll risk being fired for it. I do. I do wonder if the three dead teachers are, uh, are 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 glad that they weren't trained and armed to protect themselves when this went down. I find that to be an unfair question. Well, guys, we got uh, about a little over ten mics left before we hit the two hour mark. So I do want to start wrapping this up because I know we got some guys that got to bounce. Uh, Obviously, it's been an interesting conversation, and uh, obviously nothing's going to be solved by our conversation, but it doesn't mean we can't have the conversation. So uh, I'm going to start going around a horn so everybody can have their uh, final thoughts, and we'll just go clockwise, starting with Chad. 
Okay, uh, fantastic conversation. Um, I do think we need to uh, address, you know, Michael talked about the uh, addressing the root of the problem, and that's moral social decay in our society. Um, I don't think we really, we, we kind of gotten a little bit of, of, of argument about it, back and forth about it. Um, I don't think we really solved it tonight, but uh, hopefully that's a conversation we can have at a later date. Um, you want to stop school shootings? Um, you know, Bruce, I have to disagree with some of the stuff you said. Uh, I, I think we do need to build our schools into fortresses. We need to harden access points, barbed wire fences if you have to. Fuck it. Put a National Guard machine gun team in the main hallway ready to dispense justice if a killer comes in. Do what you got to do. We got to do what we can to protect our schools and protect the 2A. Whatever solution, it's got to do both. And whatever extreme we need to take, we need to take it. It is what it is. Um, give the cops what they need to open or even breach doors and train them on it. Every cop should have a master key to all their local schools in their jurisdiction. If not, give them door breaching shotguns. Fuck it. Give them a little amount of C4 if you have to so they can breach that door. I know that's a problem they had in Uvalde. They couldn't enter, make entry into the door. Give them flashbangs. Give them concussion grenades. Give the police what they need to do their job. Give them collapsible ladders so they can make entry into uh, multi-level buildings. Every cop should have a notebook in their car with internal maps of all their schools. Every officer on patrol should randomly stop at every school in their jurisdiction and do a walkthrough. Familiarize yourself with the inside. You know, deputy sheriffs and highway patrolmen are the worst for not doing this, typically because there are fewer of them. And most of them, most of the schools are within a city limit where the city PD has jurisdiction. Um, you know, if your department's policy is still to cordon off and wait for SWAT, then that department hasn't trained you properly and has no faith in your skills. And some administrative changes need to happen like yesterday. Well said points, Chad. I agree with just about everything you said. Um, I'll go back to something I said earlier where I think part of the problem is the schools themselves um, because clearly the shooters think they're solving a problem when they do what they do. And there's definitely a pattern there. And I think that needs to be addressed. I don't think this is a, a conversation that needs to end. And what I mean by that, as a society, we need to continue to have this conversation because if we don't have it, things will only get worse and we won't find a solution. And to the person in the comment who kept saying, kick Michael out, no, Michael's staying because he adds to the program. We all need to hear the other side, even if we don't like what they're saying. All right, so Chad, you've convinced me. Actually, I agree with you. Um, as much as I hate to see schools harden and those playgrounds being taken away, you know, if my kid's in a school where there's an active shooter, I absolutely want the, the National Guard with their M60s mounted up in machine gun nests protecting my kid. I don't care whether my kid gets playtime or not. I agree with you completely on that. Um, secondly, let's not forget who our fearless leader is. You can fire off a couple of these randomly into the air where they come down. Nobody knows. That's okay. Nothing wrong with that. But one of these guys will blow somebody's lungs out. Be careful with these. These are these are very dangerous. Um, I uh, I don't know what to say, guys. I mean, I feel terrible about having to have this whole conversation, but um, I think that unarming legal uh, law-abiding uh, civilians is the wrong answer um, to any solution that this country faces on any problem whatsoever. I think it's the same tired old comments that have, have always been made about uh, running back to gun control. It's pretty much so all been done. We've had an assault weapons ban, had no really no real impact on uh, crime within the country. And, um, you know, there's really no way to ban firearms, in my opinion, without infringing on the rights of those uh, Americans with the Second Amendment. So we have to start looking for other serious ways to address the problem. And lastly, um, someone had talked about this great medal that they were going to give almost post posthumously to, to Michael after the slaughter that he took through the comments on this, on this thread. But I got to tell you, Michael, you earned it. We're glad that you're here. We appreciate a slightly dissenting view on some of these issues. And I hope to see you in many more threads coming up, man. You've got the scars. You've, you've weathered battle here. And I hope to see you again soon. Well, thank you, Bruce. Uh, although the posthumously part kind of scared me. I hope I'm alive <laughs> to, to get the medal. Um, 
uh, thank you for having me first off. Um, always enjoy uh, speaking with you guys. And, and as always, you know, um, I love that we are able to have this conversation respectfully. I uh, would hope that the chat takes uh, some lessons from that and have those conversations with other people who may have a different point of view, but, you know, always have it um, in a respectful manner. Um, I, not to sound like a broken record, but again, um, I know that other countries, other citizens in other countries don't uh, experience this on the level and frequency that we do here in the States. Um, we're a great country. We can do great things. This is a, uh, an immense challenge that we need to overcome and we need to overcome it now. Um, so just like I'm encouraging our citizens to have conversations with one another, I encourage our politicians and for us to tell our politicians to have those conversations, even if, you know, you disagree completely with what the other points, you know, that the side's going to bring. We need to call our congressmen, call our senators and uh, say, hey, enough is enough. Let's uh, let's study this more. Let's try to figure out why this keeps happening and what we can do to prevent it. Thank you, everyone. Uh I mean, thank you to everybody on the panel, but bless you, Michael, for saying that. I think the call to action is absolutely correct. We do need to call our uh, representatives and we do need to ask for an open dialogue, an open discourse to seek solutions. So it seems to me there are two, um, two really uh, dominant issues here. There are many, many sub issues, but the dominant issues are number one, um, firearms as they relate to um, crime and violence. And then the second one is how do we protect the most vulnerable? And in this case, we're in this, you know, episode, we're specifically focusing on schools. So let's talk, talk about the first one, every credible research. Um, and I don't think, it, you know, we have to have research, but it certainly helps. Um, all research shows that, um, in nations that have higher private ownership of firearms, that is permissive laws that allow firearms, the, uh, the crime rate with firearms, notice what I'm saying, I'm not saying crime rates, I'm saying crime rates with firearms increases. Hear me out. Yes, when private ownership of firearms increases, crimes with firearms also increases. Now, Let's not even jump into the argument of, well, wait a minute, are there countries and societies that have higher violent crime that simply use sticks and machetes and Bic lighters, but not firearms? And I say, well, yes, actually there are good examples of that, but let's put that issue to the side. Because what we find is that criminals value firearms for the same reason that police value firearms, for the same reason that military value small arms, for the same reason that civilian law-abiding citizens value firearms in the countries and societies where firearm ownership, private ownership is valued, criminals also like firearms for the exact same reasons. They're concealable, they're convenient, they're violent and deadly enough to coerce their victims to do whatever they want. Okay, so that's kind of a no brainer, but again, it, it's nice to have multiple research studies that say, yeah, man, where you have more gun ownership, where it's legal, you're gonna see more gun crime. That's absolutely true. You also happen to see more self-defense with firearms in those same societies. Okay, which actually, actually, rather um, non-intuitively, it um, contributes to the violence because you're going, wait, wait, it contributes? Private ownership in self-defense contributes to the violence? Yes, yes, it does. Because 20,000 crimes with a firearm and 10,000 uh, people, you know, shooting at people to defend themselves with firearms makes the total number go from 20,000 to 30,000. 20,000 plus 10,000 defenses makes 30,000. So you're going, oh my God, 
firearm use in crime is increasing. And indeed it is. All right. Let's try another analog analogy. Planet Blueberry. Planet Blueberry. Every other member of the planet owns a Death Star. Follow me here. Every other member of Planet Blueberry owns a Death Star. No one in the planet Strawberry owns a Death Star. No one does. They're not allowed. Not even the government owns a Death Star. How many crimes do you think are committed in Planet Strawberry with Death Stars? If you said, well, probably none, since the government nor anybody else owns a Death Star on Planet Strawberry, and you would probably be correct. How many crimes have been committed on Planet Blueberry with a Death Star? And if you say, well, actually, surprisingly high number, you'd probably be correct. You'd also be correct to say how many defensive acts, defensive acts, have been, you know, per perpetuated with a Death Star. Well, actually, surprisingly high. So if you can see that, you say, wait, okay. Planet Boo Blueberry allows Death Stars. Planet Strawberry does not allow Death, death Stars. Therefore, you can see the disparity in the statistical data, but nonetheless, which one's safer? Well, we don't know. We, would, we don't know in those statistical data, do we? Okay, so that's one issue. Let's get to the other issue. The other issue is, how do we protect schools? And the answer is, we protect schools the same way you protect something else that's both vulnerable and dear to you. Oh, I don't know. Let's say your money. Your money, your money, how dear is that to you? And how vulnerable is that to you? Because I'm pretty sure you allow men with guns and security surveillance and vault doors to protect your money. And you won't allow that for your children because it doesn't look kosher to your neighbors. Shame on you. Shame on you. And shame on all the people crying crocodile tears. Oh, the latest school shooting. Yes, it's a very real tragedy. But you're a liar. You're a filthy liar. Because you never intended to protect those children anyway. You won't even protect them as much as you protect your money. Good night. I feel like Doc was yelling at me. <laughs> All right, guys, I'm going to make this quick because I know uh, some of the guys on here got to wrap this up and get out of here real quick. Um, so, again, you know, this stuff has been going on. Nothing's new under the hat. It's been going on for, for years. Firearms have been around since the founding of our, our country and before. Uh, is there a mental health problem? Yeah, but there's probably always been a mental health problem. There's always been crazy out here. Look at this map. The blue represents all the mental health issues in this country and it's a lot of it so i mean that that tells you right there there's a lot of mental cases out there and uh you know how are we going to deal with all that well <laughs> what, what can you do you can harden we can harden what's weak okay um at that school a door was found unsecure and that's how that killer got in all right i'm pretty sure that teacher that propped that door open to go get uh something out of her vehicle wasn't supposed to be doing that yes she did it anyways right? There was not a armed police officer at that school. Now, there might have been a school resource officer attached to that school, but he wasn't there when he was needed. Where was he? Okay, so there's things that could be implemented or enforced that could help curve this stuff. There's no shortage of situations in this country where somebody with a, a firearm has stopped a mass shooting from occurring. There was one in a church where one of the churchgoers, because the church had armed uh, churchgoers who actually stopped a shooter in the church before he was able, able to kill anybody, right? That's just one occurrence in a whole host of them. They just don't get paraded on the news because they don't fit the narrative. Uh, allowing teachers that have uh, licenses to carry, they've gone through, they've gotten the training, they've demonstrated uh, that they can carry a firearm. Right. Why aren't those teachers allowed to carry in those school districts? The same individuals that are telling you, oh, we want training to accommodate gun purchases are the same ones that saying that 
oh, even though those people that have had that training and have those firearms, we don't want them in the schools. All right. So with one hand, they're telling you, oh, we want you to get training before you buy this gun. Then the other hand, they're saying, oh, even though you have this gun and you have this training, we don't want you carrying in the school. All right. Well, how else are you going to stop these freaking assholes from coming in and, and murdering a bunch of people? There's only one way, and that's individual protection from those individuals. Okay. There are there's schools, districts in Texas right now that allow those some teachers that have gone through training to carry on the school campuses. I guarantee you guys, you're not going to have school shootings on those locations. Um, I mean, we could talk this to death again. We're not going to change anything. We're just kicking around a, a, a can here. Um, so I'm going to wrap this up guys. I appreciate everybody tuning in. It's uh, it's obviously a, a national issue that's going to be addressed and hopefully uh, cooler heads can prevail. And uh, for those of you that were saying that like, we don't want Michael in this conversation, guys, if we don't try to reach out and grab the individuals that are least in the middle on things on the other side, we're, we're not going to last very long. All right. Because if they had the votes right now, they'd be ramrodding every anti-gun law that they could. Uh, they don't have that. Why? Because there's certain independent or middle ground uh individuals on the other side that aren't willing to vote for that uh the anti-gun stuff just yet so we have to we have to win the hearts and minds there so that's all i have tonight guys again i appreciate everybody jumping on it's been a, a lively conversation